So since we've now talked about what Christians mean by uh, the term sin, uh, we are now going to turn to what they mean by salvation. Um, in other words, we've identified the problem, and that is what Christians call sin. Uh, and remember, the sin is oftentimes defined as estrangement or brokenness, something that really separates relationships, not only separates relationships between humanity and God, but also humans and other humans, uh, humans and the world, creation, animals, and then also humans within themselves. Uh, so when, when one sins, uh, not only are they separated from a relationship with God, but they are also oftentimes separated from a relationship with other people. So if sin is the problem, uh, then we have to now talk about salvation. And what Christians mean about or mean uh, with salvation is to try to unpack the significance of Jesus, um, the, the reconciling work that God did in Christ to bring this relationship back uh, to be reconciled. So if, if sin is brokenness, then salvation is best understood as reconciliation, as rejoining, uh, as bringing the relationship back into its proper, uh, its proper stance. So I want to try to walk through kind of how Christians have thought historically about the uh, adoption of salvation. And then this discussion is going to be directly linked to what we talk about, what we say about Jesus. And so please uh, remember what we say in those discussions as well. So uh, the first thing here, and let me just highlight this one more time. Uh, salvation is, is really the reconciliation of relationships. If sin is the breakdown of those relationships, then uh, salvation is the reconciliation of these relationships. And, and what Christians say is that uniquely through the event of Jesus, um, that God has, has reached down to humanity to reconcile them to himself. Now, this is not, in, in many cases, just limited to the work of Jesus. Now, Jesus, for sure, is the climax of God's salvific work. But many scholars would say that the salvific work that God has been doing uh, throughout history began uh, at the initial fall, at the initial breakdown of those relationships. God has always been in the business of trying to reconcile them. In the New Testament, we have a few um, parables that Jesus tells of a vineyard uh, where there is a vineyard owner uh, and there are people that work in the vineyard. And, uh, and the owner sends um, you know, his, his friend to the people in the vineyard. Um, the owner sends you know, prophets, if you will, um, to people in the vineyard uh, to try to get payment, to try to reconcile this relationship. And just every time that the owner of the vineyard sends somebody there, uh, the, the people of the vineyard reject him. The people of the, the vineyard uh, sometimes kill him because the story kind of climaxes with the owner of the vineyard sending his own son. He says, surely they will accept my own son. But we, what we read in that parable is even the, the son is killed by the vineyard owner or by the people in the vineyard. And very, very similarly, so too, that uh, throughout all of, of Jewish and Christian history, God has been in the business, has, has been trying to reconcile relationships. And so we hear even of the, the stories of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and, uh, and we hear the stories of, of Moses, the stories of, of the, um, the judges in the book of Judges, uh, some of the, the women leaders, uh, for sure, in the Hebrew Bible as well, and then the prophets. Uh, the kings, the, these people through whom God was trying to reconcile these relationships. And what Christians end up saying is that the climactic moment of God's reconciliation is seen most fully, most fundamentally in the life, death, and particularly the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so here, um, remember, you need to understand that, that term, uh, reconciliation. So the term that Christians oftentimes uh, use to talk about how this happened, how God did, in fact, reconcile the world to himself, is uh, the term atonement. And so be sure you, you read the book here to understand uh, how uh, Christians use this word. I'm not going to talk about it much here, but it really suggests something very, very crucial in our relationship. So at one moment, at that one moment where um, a deeply estranged relationship is reconciled, now, some of you guys m might know this very well. Some of you guys really might know estrangement. You might understand estranged relationships. And I'm not talking about like, oh, your best friend is mad at you for a day. I'm talking about like deep and fundamentally broken relationships. Some of you guys unfortunately know that. 
And then also some of you do know what I'm talking about here with the reconciliation, where two parties that are deeply and fundamentally estranged from each other are brought back into united uh, whole relationship again. Um, so, and let me just move, move me up here for a second. So this really signifies, whatever we're gonna be talking about next, signifies the personal reconciliation of responsible people who have been violently or morally opposed to one another. And, and here, please understand what I'm saying here. So when, what we are going to be talking about in the doctrine of salvation signifies the reconciliation of responsible people. That, that, that Christians believe that human beings do things intentionally and unintentionally by participating in this capital S sin that fundamentally break down relationships. We do, whether we mean to or not. We, we break down relationships. And so what we are talking about in this doctrine of salvation is the responsible parties who know that they do wrong, who know that they break down relationships, being reconciled back to each other. So uh, one more thing. There are two keys to this term, and please uh, take this to heart. The first is this involves deeply interpersonal relationships. Um, you, we've said all along that God is a relational God. Uh, and as a relational God, uh, God tries to be in a relationship with people. And people um, oftentimes respond in that relationship. And But what you know, as well as I know, is that people uh, fail relationships. And so whenever we are talking about a doctrine of salvation, we are really talking fundamentally about deeply personal relationships. And then the second thing that we are talking about is the reconciliation. I'm going to say this word probably 20 more times. Um, if we have deeply interpersonal relationships that sometimes experience estrangement, what we are going to be talking about is a deep uh, and profound and meaningful bringing together, reconciliation of estranged relationships. So something that's, uh, and again, one more time, there it is. I'm not going to say that, but here is, is the core of what we're talking about. So I want to turn now to some of the theories of atonement. In other words, trying to look into scripture and say, uh, this is how uh, salvation occurred. This is how God did work in Jesus. Now, I'm going to outline five of these theories, uh, and these have been proposed kind of throughout the history of Christianity, but let me make something very, very clear. The, the church has never officially endorsed one of these theories of atonement. Now, there is biblical support for all of these. For example, in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus being the substitution uh, or Jesus paying the ransom. In the New Testament, it talks about Jesus um, uh, being kind of like this moral teacher. And the reason that the Catholic Church has never officially endorsed one of them is that if you only endorse one, that is going to be incomplete of the larger mystery here. So really what we are talking about is like the core of Christianity. And this is where deep, deep mystery, profound mystery uh, comes alive. How did God reconcile the world to himself in the Christ event? Man, it takes books and books and books written by saints, written by people who are so much more in love with God and attuned with God's heart than, than I uh, ever will be. Uh, it takes these brilliant minds, these devout uh, believers, these, these profound saints of the church to unpack a lot of this deep mystery. And so all of these theories are going to be limited and profoundly incomplete. Now, the first theory that I want to talk about just briefly is known as the, the sacrificial theory of atonement. This is otherwise known as the penal sacri- or the, uh, no, we'll get there in a second. Um, the sacrificial theory of atonement is deeply influenced by the Hebrew Bible and the sacrificial language that exists therein. So oftentimes in the Hebrew Bible, the way that the Jews worshipped was by, um, by making a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, either by an individual or by a community, for the sins of those people. And so year after year, if you were a devout Jew, or even if you weren't that devout, you would likely go to uh, the temple down in Jerusalem, or up in Jerusalem, depending on where you lived, to make a sacrifice. Because the Jews really believed that by making sacrifices, that they are set back into this right and proper relationship with God. And so, and again, this language is present in the New Testament as well. So therefore, what these people who propose the sacrificial theory of atonement say is that Christ was the full sacrifice for sin. 
So animal sacrifices in ancient, uh, in ancient Jewish culture and ancient Jewish religion, uh, they, were, they were sacrifices, but they were incomplete. So what, what these people say is what we really needed was a human sacrifice, a sacrifice from God, God's self, uh, to sacrifice himself, uh, to be the, the full and complete sacrifice for all of human sin. Uh, this might sound familiar to some of you because this language is quite present in many churches here um, in, in Texas, in the United States, um, and also in the West. Now, something that is deeply connected to the sacrificial theory of atonement, and you'll see how these are similar, is known as the substitution theory of atonement. This is where I misspoke earlier. This is oftentimes referred as the penal substitution theory of atonement. <clears throat> now, this theory says, that uh, and here they are quoting Romans because I said all of these have biblical support. Uh, these people s uh, really quote the book of Romans, particularly the sixth chapter, which which uh, Paul writes: "The wages of sin is death." So the wages of sin is death because I am a sinner. Because Christians believe all people sin, uh, that they deserve death. But what Paul says in the book of Romans is that the gift of God is eternal life. And so what he's saying here is that because individuals sin, they deserve death. They deserve uh, to die. But what Jesus did in his sacrifice, and notice there is similar language here in sacrifice as in the previous, uh, the previous theory. What Jesus did in his sacrifice is he substituted himself in my place. So sometimes you will hear um, many well-meaning Christians say that God died for you. God died in your place. Jesus died in your place. And what they are really uh, espousing there is, is the substitutionary theory of atonement. I, you know, I'm a sinner. I deserve death. But what Jesus did is he died the death that I deserved. And so therefore Christ in his sacrifice died the death that humans deserve, thereby, thereby liberating them from the slavery to sin. Uh, it is, you know, I who no longer has, has to die this death. Jesus died it in my place. And therefore, I can go about living a free uh, and, and liberated life, uh, you know, that doesn't have uh, sin as a part of my narrative anymore. Now, one thing you'll notice is, um, is this is oftentimes thought of in individual terms. Jesus died for me. He substituted himself in my place. Uh, you'll see a little bit later on, there are other theories that focus uh, that Jesus did things for the entire world, not just for individuals. Uh, because in the substitution theory of atonement, also in, uh, in the sacrificial theory of atonement, what hinges, salvation hinges upon, hinges upon the individual accepting Jesus as the substitution or Jesus as the sacrifice. Uh, the third theory, and this is uh, an interesting one, uh, this is outlined pretty well in, in the book by McGrath. Uh, this is known as the ransom theory of atonement. So these people have said um, it, throughout history, not very popular today anymore, but it was popular uh, about four or five hundred years ago, uh, that evil rules the world, that, that you know, God no, does not rule the world. In fact, the world is evil because it is ruled by Satan. It is ruled by evil. And what these people uh, propose is that God, what God did, is he had to pay a ransom to the devil, to Satan. And so what they say is that God disguised himself as Jesus. Nobody knew that Jesus was God. And yet when Jesus died and he went to the place of the dead, in a sense, the metaphor I like to use is he, he took off his mask in, in very good, like Mission Impossible style. He peeled off this mask. And it's then that the devil realized that Jesus was God. And so what God did in the Christ event was paid a ransom to the devil. And therefore, because a ransom was paid, so if, here, think of a, a real ransom. So if I was, uh, you know, if I was kidnapped uh, by somebody who wanted a new car, I don't know, cheesy example, um, then, you know, we, the people would buy them a new car and then I would be freed. Um, unfortunately, we do see this uh, in, in the real world today. The people are kidnapped, the people are taken and there is a ransom that is demanded. So think in those types of terms, because that's what the people were really thinking of when they created this theory of atonement. So in a sense, the devil was tricked, uh, and God paid a ransom, and therefore the world is no longer ruled by Satan. The world is no longer ruled by the devil. That The world is now liberated. The world is now ruled by God, 
because he is now paid a ransom to the devil. Uh, the next one is the moral influence theory. So these people say that Jesus was significant because he taught people how to live a moral life. So Jesus, it doesn't really matter for these people if Jesus is fully divine or if Jesus is fully human. Uh, it doesn't really matter that Jesus uh, you know, performed this, this ontological um, significant event, um, really adjusting the, uh, the nature of humanity. These people rather just say that Jesus was a, a really good person. Um, he taught people how to live not only a moral life, but the moral life. And so Jesus is, is significant for that reason. And so therefore, the follower of Jesus is to uh, follow the moral teachings of him. So salvation, how one achieves salvation, is by following the moral example of Jesus. Okay, Jesus has said, you know, to love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. Okay, so if I'm going to, um, to be saved, if I'm going to participate in salvation, I just need to love my enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And so this sometimes turns religion or Jesus into just a moral figure. It doesn't matter, again, uh, in this as much if he is fully divine or fully human. It just matters that Jesus taught a moral life, and therefore I need to follow him and his moral teachings. Now, the final uh, theory of atonement, and again, these are just the top five. There are others out there. And again, remember, please, that all of these are limited and incomplete. Uh, this is known as the Christus Victor model. This has been quite popular over the last 200 years or so in, in Christianity. So what this argues is, is yes, um, the death of Jesus is significant, but rather uh, the resurrection of Jesus is even more significant. Because Christ is victorious uh, in the resurrection, in the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus is victorious over the powers and principalities of this world. So what killed Jesus, not only was his deep love for humanity, but really the powers of this world. Think back to the, the 10th grade class when we were talking about what killed Jesus. Uh, for the theologian named Marcus Borg, what killed Jesus was uh, what he calls the domination system. Uh, the, the system of power, the system of privilege, the system uh, of economic and political and racial power, that those are the things that killed Jesus, not only from the Romans, but also from the Jewish elite. And what the Christus Victor theory of atonement says is that what, what happened in the resurrection is God is victorious over the powers of this world. Because if you think about it, death is the most powerful and the most threatening thing that somebody can um, can place upon another individual. But what we see in the resurrection is Jesus is, is more powerful than, than death. Uh, so therefore, the victory of Christ over the grave has deep worldly and universal implications. So the world here, uh, the, the things that we think are powerful, the people, the institutions, the communities, the, uh, the nations, they aren't altogether that powerful. Because what is powerful is God's work in Christ. What is powerful is God's uh, resurrecting Jesus from the dead. Uh, in the New Testament letters, Paul uh, writes a really interesting phrase. He says that God's power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, power, the power of love, the power of forgiveness, the power really of God is made perfect, not in the powers of this world, but rather in the power of Christ. Uh, so therefore, it is, uh, it is God in Jesus who is victorious over the powers and principalities of this world. Um, so therefore, the world can be victorious over sin. Okay, personal sin, communal sin, as participants in the kingdom of God. Let me again reference the Lord's Prayer when Jesus says, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. What Christians are saying is, bring God's kingdom now on earth which is fully recognizing that the kingdoms of this world are less powerful than we give them credit. Uh, that it is actually the kingdom of God, this kingdom of love, this kingdom that has a very interest, uh, interesting ethic of forgiveness, of mercy, of turning the other cheek. That is really where we see the power of salvation. So since we've read a lot of N.T. Wright uh, here, uh, uh, I want to make sure that, that we understand how he understands salvation. He argues that God created the world, and the world was necessarily good. Humans were created in the image of God. Sin has caused a deep estrangement, causing the, the, uh, God's desire for 
uh, humanity and God to live in unity, and that has gone awry. And so what he argues is that in Christ, God is working to set the world right. If this is how God created the world and sin kind of turned it upside down, what God is doing in Christ is writing this relationship, is, is correcting what, what God really intends for the world. And so therefore, what, what it means uh, to be a Christian is to participate in the correcting, in the writing of the world, in the reshaping of the world to be the, uh, the kingdom, the, the world that God really desired. And so Jesus is deeply significant because he not only shows us the way to live as God intended, but he did something ontologically. And there I'm talking about something like about being. He did, so, he did something existentially. He fundamentally shaped, according to N.T. Wright and according to many, many Christian theologians, he fundamentally shaped uh, the outlook of the world. The, the, what God did in Jesus was began, or he began to set the world on the correct trajectory, uh, on the trajectory towards which God has desired uh, from the beginning that we read in the book of Genesis. Um, and, and so I know you can't read all this down here, So, but I say God's final victory is a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, if you want to read um, Gen or Revelation 21, you will read of, of a new heaven and a new earth coming together. Uh, so no longer is there a separation between God and humanity, but they are brought together in the fullness, in the deep implications of salvation. And, and so therefore, let me go back to where I started here. What are the, or the cross, uh, with the cross and forgiveness? Um, the individual experiences forgiveness because of the cross. Okay, I personally experienced the forgiving or the forgiveness of God by what God did in Christ with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Communities, larger groups of people, uh, you could even argue that the world experiences forgiveness of what God did in Christ. So it is not just uh, what you, or individual forgiveness, but it is also communal forgiveness. <coughs> So because I'm forgiven, because of uh, the fact that, that we are talking about reconciliation, I am now invited to, to follow a, a whole new way of living. In the Gospels, there are a few parables that Jesus tells of people who are in deep, deep debt to somebody else. And, and I can think of two off, off the top of my head. And there is one man who is forgiven of his debt, an insurmountable debt. I think in today's world, it would be millions of dollars. He is forgiven of his debt. And he goes to somebody who owes him money. And he says, I will you know, make you a slave. I will hold you until you pay the final penny to me. And what's interesting there is this man had just been forgiven and he goes to somebody else and he demands that his debt is fully paid. And then in another parable, and, and Jesus, you can see what he's trying to do here. In another parable, Jesus says, you know, there was a man who was forgiven a great amount of debt. And what he did is he goes out and he forgives the debt of other people. Because what we see here with the doctrine of salvation is that if one experiences not only estrangement, but, but most fully and, and greatly reconciliation, that they therefore go out and they are living as part of reconciled people. Uh, this is why Christians, they pass the peace uh, before they take communion, because really they believe in reconciliation. Uh, so uh, on a personal and somewhat spiritual note, uh, if there are people that you are deeply estranged with, uh, do things to bring about reconciliation. Um, I'm recording this in uh, the summer of 2015, um, and it's been a very tumultuous summer of race, race relationships in America. What would our world look like if Christians really uh, participated in the forgiving acts of God in Christ by bringing together relationships, by recognizing what people have in common more uh, than what they have uh, that is different, to really participate in forgiveness? Uh, whether it is over racial barriers, uh, whether it is over gender, religious barriers, uh, to bring really about God's vision of the world as a reconciled people. So uh, here, this new life includes as working as members of God's kingdom. 
Uh, this is what Christians mean when it means uh, when they talk about being Christian. Uh, they they say that, that when one prays the Lord's prayer, they are praying in a sense the pledge of allegiance to this kingdom life, to this new way of living. It is not the kingdom of this world, but it is rather the kingdom of God that we see in Jesus. Uh, again, the kingdom of reconciliation, uh, the kingdom of love, the kingdom of forgiveness, and all of those are embodied in, in what they mean by the kingdom of salvation, the kingdom of God. So here, let me go back to where I began. So salvation signifies the personal reconciliation of, of responsible people who have been violently and morally opposed to one another. Now Christians say that this was between humanity and God. They also, and you don't need to look for, for more than one minute on the, the nightly news, that this also happens between other people. And so we are talking about the bilateral move of two responsible parties being brought into uh, a proper relationship of reconciliation. So here, the, the move of God, the unilateral move of God is what God has been doing throughout all of the Hebrew Bible and then most fully through Jesus to move towards creation to move towards humanity in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, the bilateral move is the response of humans, the response of creation itself, uh, to move back to God and to unite in what Christians call the kingdom of God. And it is this, as you will see here, um, as we start talking about a doctrine of eschatology, of the end of the world. This vision is what Christians really believe, of people being united in relationship, with God and with humanity, with creation. If you need to think of this as, uh, as Genesis 1, 2, and 3, then do it. Because that is the vision of salvation, of people living in harmony, not only with God, but with each other and with the very world itself. Uh, so what's at stake here? Um, what, are we find, what are we really talking about? Well, we understand that sin is much more exhaustive uh, than personal sin. Uh, sin is so much more than, you know, me not cheating on a test or me, uh, you know, not yelling at somebody when I am driving. Um, sin um, is not, you know, just like me not cheating on my taxes. Um, sin is, is so much deeper than that. It extends deep into the heart of humanity. But as deep as sin goes, salvation, it goes just as deep. <laughs> Um, salvation is so much more than me just getting into heaven. Uh, if sin is deep, then salvation goes just as deep or even deeper to liberate people out of that sin, to bring them into this proper stance, this proper relationship with God and with other people. And so really what we are talking about here uh, is, is the, the culmination of a discussion on humanity and sin and salvation. Because Christians, uh, most of them, don't just say that Jesus was a moral figure. They really fundamentally look at Jesus as the one through whom God was working through to bring about this reconciled world in which God created. So what's at stake in all of this? Uh, all of this uh, it really is talking about a deep and profound reconciliation of violently opposed relationships and this is, is starting to get at the heart of what Christians mean when they are talking about a doctrine of salvation. So I do hope that this helped. I hope that, that you are able to really understand uh, a little bit more fully what Christians mean by talking about salvation. It's not just me going to heaven. It's really about God recreating, about God bringing the world uh, into the, the world that God desired, the world that God uh, really um, wants the world to be. And this is the world that God created. This is the world that Christians believe God loved. And this is the world that, that Christians believe God gave his son to bring about the state of salvation, the state of redemption.